Hey family, Candy Carter is our guest today and may just be my new BFF. Candy began her career in television having produced Oprah Show, The View, and Tamron Hall. As a matter of fact, my own appearances on Oprah and The View were made under her production. Today, she is the Chief Content Officer at Knocking. Knocking.com is a content commerce company. She's also the founder of We've Got Friends, a nonprofit dedicated to helping teens with special needs develop friend groups of their own. You're in for some fun, some tears, and some learning. Most importantly, you get to meet Candy. Candy, listen, I'm so excited to be talking with you. Wow, there's so much that I know you can share. But First, let's talk about this nonprofit that you uh, founded called We've Got Friends. It sounds so incredible to me. And I think maybe talking about how you got that started and where it is today can really be a great launch to all the other things we want to share today. Yeah, we just saw each other at Holly Robinson. Pete, um, she has a foundation for uh, kids with special needs. She honored me at that event. That's where I saw you there. Um, here's the bottom line. I'm a mom. I have two kids. My firstborn has special needs. When kids are no longer supervised on a play date, special needs kids lose out. You can drop off middle schoolers and high schoolers to the movies. They can go walk around on their own and hang out. Our kids are sitting at home. They don't get invited to birthday parties. They aren't on little league teams. They typically are district out. So they don't even go to school with kids who live near them. And it was a very selfish thing. I wanted my child to have a friend. So I put flyers at a school and I said, my church is going to let me use the rectory every other week. I'm bringing pizza, some games, and we're going to hang out. And three kids, five, 10, 15, 25 with parents. And I called it, we've got friends because I was like, you know what? We've now got friends. We have each other. And four years ago, it was just that. Um, I'm a golfer. I did a couple golf outings. I was able to raise enough money to pay an executive director to come in and oversee the programming because I have a job, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> so right? This became like way too much for me to handle, but I had all of these families who depended on these groups. So in four years, we've built 11 groups. We have three virtual groups uh, a week. Where and are the eight? Where are the eight that aren't virtual? Primarily in New Jersey. So Montclair, New Jersey is where it started. We started expanding out. We're at the Newark school. Uh, we're at a school in Newark, New Jersey for inner city kids. Uh, and we're expanding into some other inner city neighborhoods. We're starting a new chapter at the Harlem School of the Arts in New York and another one in Connecticut. A lot of our kids who started as teens four years ago are now going to be adults. So we'll end up doing Knocking Plus because that's my son and his friends. But the bottom line is this. You look at a kid in a wheelchair, you look at a kid with special needs, and a lot of people go, well, why does that kid need a friend? Well, we all need a friend. We all need friendship. When something happens, who's the first person you call? Your home girl. I got right. engaged. Oh my gosh. I got a promotion. You call a friend. And our kids need friends as much as everybody else. And that level of socialization, and this is the last thing I'll say is, during the pandemic, we all experienced how it feels to not be in friendship to not be in community with other people. And it was painful and it hurt. And some people couldn't survive it, right? Imagine that's your life every day. So when these kids come to We Got Friends, for the first time, they feel like they belong. They feel like they're a part of community. And, and it's a simple concept. Create the space, put them in it, fall back. That's it. So... That's the basic thing that I want to take all over the world. And we're growing. We have another fundraiser coming up. It's WGFNJ for New Jersey.com. We've got friends, New Jersey.com. Um, you know, join. People can volunteer from everywhere because you can volunteer with our virtual groups. We're always looking for teachers. Um, but it's something that we're going to spread throughout the country and around the world. Even if we're not joining the community in an active way, uh, we can support the community through this as well? Absolutely, through donations, 
um, which is the primary thing because we underwrite buses, we underwrite custodians who keep the schools open so we can have the groups. Um, it allows us to expand and do other groups. Um, eventually we wanna partner with the Boys and Girls Club, you know, places that have community of youth and space right? And then we can host groups in those different locations. And that'll help us. School districts, municipalities should be paying for this. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And I agree with you. Uh, and I'll be supporting you. I'm so oh, excited yeah. to know what you're doing. I mean, the work that Holly Rod does is just incredible. And actually, I learned about the work through following the show on TV, even though I knew the family, you know, from uh, everybody in L.A. kind of has is one degree of separation from someone. Uh, but it was really um, one of the best things I did was to become, you know, a supporter of Holly Rod. With We've Got Friends, are all friends special needs or do you have friends who can be left and the parents can leave? There are kids who are, so they're all functioning. And that's why when we create the space, there's some games, there's music, there's this, so that the lower functioning kids like my son, he can go listen to music. He can kind of just walk around and be in the space. The higher functioning kids find each other. They play games together. They do other things. But what's key about this age group, high school, is that when you talk about placement in the workplace, right, which you do, right. these kids have to be placed at some point. So their ability to socialize on their own, to understand community, to understand kind of give and take and playing games. And that all helps in placement because the, the highest unemployment rate in this country are people with special needs. Right, right. And a lot of them are high functioning enough to work, right? And so that's a challenge in itself. So there are a lot of benefits to creating the space for them. One dad says to me, one of the kids during the pandemic, he was the leader. He'd get on, his name was Gabriel. He's like, okay, where's everybody? There's Emerson, there's this person. He was a natural leader. And his dad came up to me after the pandemic and said, had it not been for We've Got Friends, I would have never known that my child is a leader. He's a leader because he is in his space with his tribe and he flourished and grew. And his dad from that point on thought to himself, well, my son can do other things, right? He can work, he can do this, he can do that. And they're all capable, but they get shoved in the corner. They're unseen, right? And mm -hmm. so one of our basic staples is we look them right in the eye. Even if they don't respond, we keep talking to them because they hear you, they understand, right? Um, it's just that their socialization looks a little different than us. But it's and so many of us who thought we were full functioning uh, before these last two years went into distancing and work from home and mm -hmm. learned a lot about ourselves and the mm -hmm. needs we have as well. So I think that if there is a case study that can be drawn from We've Got Friends, I mean, just that wow moment of this dad, Gabriel, learning yeah. his son is a leader. I think that, that, that there's going to be so much to share from this as it continues to grow. And I think it can be a template or pilot for so many others. Um, everybody was identifying where their needs were, I think, in a more transparent, perhaps more honest, or sometimes mm -hmm. just exploratory way than we did before we all got sent home for COVID. So I agree. Uh, as we exit, I pray that we exit with some of those uh, teachings that we experience becoming uh, parts of how we set our values and how we start to template our own lives. Um, this is this is really beautiful. And we've got friends had to have been something that you may be didn't know you were going to start earlier. Oh, I didn't know. No. <laughs> you know, they always say it's necessity, right? And, and it's right. funny, after the first year, the you know, and I would go, I mean, I was running the groups initially, but my son was also benefiting. And so after the first year, the moms came up to me tearful, you know, handing me cards and gifts. And I was like, what are y'all crying about? And they're just like, you have no idea how much you have changed our all of our lives, our entire family, because when you can't take a kid out, right? Nobody goes, right? So it's like, or one parent has to go and the other one can't. Mm -hmm. And it's, I had a kid stripped naked in the middle of a group and everybody was like, oh, it's all good. You know, the dad's right, like, oh, right. 
Cool. So it's a safe space. It allows the whole family to get out. They have something to look forward to every week, right? And then now we've created other activities around it. We just got a, a recreation grant for $15,000. So now we can do other things with the kids, right? They can experience other things in the world. And look, for special needs families, because this is free for the families, that's also why we do fundraising. It's very expensive. People don't understand. People who have kids with special needs, they pay for all of these outside therapies that are oftentimes not covered by the school district. They have to pay for lawyers to fight for their kids to get in the right classes. I mean, it, it's 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 like playing an expensive sport, but it ain't fun, right? Like you're just <laughs> yeah. Well, you have yesterday, to spend all this money, you know? Yeah, you you know, Candy. Yesterday, I had a conversation with uh, Lady Doctor uh, Rebecca Swartzlos, and she does neurological research. Quite an incredible lady. And Brainscapes is uh, her newest book. I, I encourage you to look her up and I'd love to connect the two of you because I just believe there's so much that can be enjoyable for us to learn, not simply painful for us to learn. And uh, not to add any more to you, though, because I mean, you're doing so much, you know, and people often ask me about work life balance and they're asking for my tips and advice. But since you're obviously very dedicated to your children and you're, you're very active professionally, why don't you talk with us a little bit about um, what advice or feelings you have about this idea of work-life balance. You have some very varied perspectives given that now you, oh, you're laughing. Go for it, girl, go, go, go. No, I'm laughing because I haven't had work-life balance in 30 years until this <laughs> Right, um, right. No, I will tell you, I, I've, I, I'm. my joke is that I'm channeling Gen Z, right? Because for many, many, many years, I took pride in saying I do more before 9 a.m. than people do all day, right? That little army slogan, because that was me. I worked at Oprah. I mean, we worked, if you listen to, there's a great podcast called Making Oprah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think WBZ or somebody out of Chicago did it. It's four hours of phenomenal listening. And it is, and I worked there and I was like, oh my gosh. But the thing that rang true that we all knew is that we worked around the clock. And we were young and we were here. We had the number one show on TV, right? And she so that talked a lot about uh, how that kind of affinity for work started mm -hmm. to hurt her uh, in her own personal life and health, didn't she? Well, I didn't hear, I haven't heard that, but I'm just saying mm -hmm. like, um, maybe she has, but like, mm -hmm. we all worked like crazy people. We used to call our husbands the Harpo widows because. <laughs> I would say like, I'll be home at seven and then I'd be home at like two and then back at 7 a.m. But, you know, I have to say I haven't, one of the things I've been able to do very successfully for 30 years is manage my time, right? I wouldn't say that it was balanced, right? I definitely put work first. I had these very high powered jobs that required that of me, right? The only way I couldn't do it is if I left and that was non-negotiable because I love what I do. And this is who I am, right? But one of the things I always tell people is your life is your schedule. And so you don't just schedule work things, but you schedule your social time, right? I always tell, I always got up at 4.35 a.m. That allowed me to work out and get things done, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'd have a little side hustle. If you typically get up at 8 a.m. every day and you get up at 5 a.m., right? That's 15 hours of productive time when your entire house is asleep. And people always say, well, I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. One of my strategies is you got a sink full of dishes, right? And you feel too busy. And it's like, do the dishes and time it. It literally takes about four minutes to empty a dish, maybe five minutes total to empty a dishwasher and load it. Five minutes. You can't find five minutes. You know what I mean? And so when you start to compartmentalize the things that you have to do and you look at exactly how much time it actually takes, it becomes less of a, oh, I got so much to do. No, I have three things to do. One's going to take five minutes. One's going to take three and a half minutes. And one's going to take seven minutes, right? That's not an astronomical amount of time. And, you know, I think, you know, one of the things I also tell people is like, if you give yourself, even just give yourself two extra hours in the morning when everybody's asleep, you'd be amazed at how much you can get done. And again, people feel like 
oh, it's so overwhelming. Well, just do one thing every day. Just do, like, if you have a goal, I want to start this business. I want to, I want to work on my foundation, then pick one hour and one thing every day to get done. And if you finish that one thing and you can hit three more, great, right? But it's really about in your mind, organizing those things that you want to do, right? And then scheduling them so that you can actually do them because the amount of accomplishment you feel on the back end far outweighs the like 10 minutes to like break it down. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that's how I kind of get through being busy is I really I, I, look like, I love it. I, right. I, 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 I love it. And, and, and organizing it the way you describe means that you are also probably going to do a lot less busy work because you're intentional as you walk in. So you have it time to complete. Mama used to tell us as we were growing up, uh, make sure that you have music or you're singing when you're doing those things as well. And it helps you. And um, music is so important, I think. And a lot of times we don't, you're smiling on that. A yeah, lot I do it with cooking. So people used to, if you talk to people who work with me at like Tamron Hall and, and other shows, like, or even when I was at Harpo, I used to literally cook five meals in one sitting and then label them. Like I take a Sharpie and, and just label everything, pack it up, stick it in the fridge. And I used to post it and people were like, oh my God. But again, it's not as big as it seems. If you have a crock pot, a stove top and an oven, right? You can throw something in a casserole dish, throw it in the oven, cook something on the top and throw something in the crock pot. That's three meals. Mm -hmm. right and I think people right? use those, people started using those air fryers air fryer. as well, didn't they? That's uh, right. Yeah, anyway, I, I I just love where you're going with that. And I think it's going to be helpful to a lot of people. What I want to dive into, Candy, now is um, your upbringing. But first, let's talk about e-commerce because that's what you're doing a lot of now. And it seems like a radical shift from television producing. So what is this knocking.com? How did you get involved in um Actually, what are you most excited about in this next chapter of your life? Well, here's what's so interesting. So up until literally February, I've been working in daytime and running a production company and working around the clock, right? So this is the first time that I've had the space, right? To take 30 years of knowledge and experience and, and media, right? And actually be a little, like working a little bit smarter and not working like I'm two years out of college. That was my thing. I'm like, I'm 53. I've been doing this for 30 years. Why am I working 16 hour days, six days a week? Like, I don't need to do that. I bring more value to the table. And again, it's really just looking at things and assessing. But e-commerce is actually very much intertwined with media. So Knocking is a company that I brought to the Tamron Hall show. It's a company that I brought into Disney. So when I was the executive producer of The View, if anybody watches The View, every Monday there's a segment called View Your Deal. And in View Your Deal, there's a variety of products usually on tables and like Sonny Hostin or Sarah Haynes and Greta Monaghan will go to each product and say, oh my God, this mug is amazing. It self-heats, it keeps your coffee warm and it's $15.99 today, but normally it's $30, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's been happening for several years. And so when I took over the Tamron Hall show, I wanted to create a similar e-commerce segment because they're very profitable for media companies. In a time where ratings are down, a lot of ad dollars are going to streamers and cable networks. People are trying to find alternative streams of revenue and e-commerce is a big stream of revenue for media. And so I met that company when I was there, when I transitioned off the Tamron Hall show, they said, come work with us, right? We're doing local steals and deals across the country and newscasts, but we want to get to that next level, right? You're a media person. You've been in this business forever. And that is the marriage and e-commerce just so we're all clear is a gub billion dollar business. E-commerce is slated to grow massively over the next five years. Mm -hmm. So it is such an exciting- And I imagine COVID helped that dynamic. Oh, oh my goodness. Knocking is a four-year-old company that was just named on the Inc. 5000 list, number mm -hmm. 664. Mm -hmm. You know, they've grown 
leaps and bounds in four years. And when people were at home in the pandemic, the company just took off because everybody was shopping at home. When the world felt dangerous, what do people do? They come back inside, they do stuff online. And so e-commerce was initially just shop on Amazon, whatever. Now we're infusing product into content in a way that no one's ever seen before. And oh. people love it. So, so, so Candy, then it sounds as though you think that this marriage of media and commerce is just inevitable at this point. What oh, do yeah. you think shoppable TV might look like in 10 years, five years? History happens so quickly. Well, just so we're clear, it's going to happen in like two years. But, yeah, yeah. You know, right now, shoppable content is very much like unscripted morning shows and things like that. But you're going to start seeing, you're watching your favorite scripted show and they're like, hey, for this challenge, we're going to use this makeup and just hit the QR code and you can get it. Like you are just going to be able to buy the things that you want when you want them while you're watching content. And that's not just TV. I mean, most content now is consumed on streaming networks, on YouTube and on your phone. So, so that's offering a lot of opportunity for tech too, because one yeah. of the things that happens is, let's say you're watching your device, whether it's TV or whatever, right? And you have the um, access to shop. You got to stop something to do that. But technology now, I think is going to move to a place where I can just and keep watching and then, you know, complete the purchase or whatever as I want or complete now. I, I, I think we're going to get, get that very quickly don't 100%. you oh and live shopping and you know i think there are going to be new iterations of of what you see with qvc um there's a young influencer i believe in china who basically did his own kind of qvc thing and sold millions of dollars worth of products so it, it's it's the world is opening up and people are ready for it well, what are the other shifts that you're seeing in media, Candy? And when you look at it over the uh, years of your career, what do you think we're heading toward now in general? I think there is a shift um, where ad dollars are going to different places. So traditional media, right? So traditional networks are looking for new ways to generate revenue, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, ad, ad, you know, ad sales are still very, very big, but I think there are going to be, there's going to be a bigger push for how do we get this non-traditional revenue in, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's going to be really exciting things. We're actually working with a scripted show that has a brand and we're going to build a product for that brand. So, um, that's very exciting. Well, let's talk about um, your upbringing now. I want to know all about where you grew up, how you grew up, your family, stuff that you care to share, okay? Like, I mean, you're an amazing person. There, there's a whole brand around you. I see how you work and you're delivering other people's brand and helping to shape and uh, 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 and, and elevate it. But you're a whole brand yourself. Well, Talk about your upbringing. Well, to my to everybody's surprise, I'm from Merrimack, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I grew up riding horses every week. Um, we lived in a community with four black families, and in my high school, it was me, my brother, Jim Reed, um, Mike Reed, <laughs> Billy Clay, and Eric Clay, and that was it. <laughs> as far as uh, black folks in New Hampshire, so um, I ran track, and I was. Uh, number one in the state for most of my events. I went on a full NCAA scholarship to Boston College and uh, ran track there and was a communications major. I, at the time, thought I wanted to be on camera. I had a really cute like anchor hair and um, I thought I could be cute. And uh, I did my first, oh, I didn't have many internships in college because I was running track and I wasn't allowed to work. So when I got out of college, I moved to Atlanta, I had no job. Um, and you know, it took me 11 months with a Boston college degree to get a job, but I just hustled and, worked, wow. you know, did telemarketing and worked at the gap. And I knew I wanted to work in television. I wasn't willing to do anything else. So, um, I ended up getting, why do you think it took 11 months? And so, you know, I'm in the employment field, so people are knocking our door down and, um, 
oftentimes, and there, there, you know, you may have some uh, perspective on that, Candy, yourself, as many do. Oftentimes, people are, uh, we have to educate them on how to search for talent, because they'll just call and say, we need somebody black, we, we need to increase our, you know, hiring of black, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you're a Boston College grad. <laughs> and I know you were pre George Floyd, but well, but here's the thing with television, the way you get TV jobs is internships. And what hurt me is that I couldn't intern while I was, while I was running track, mm -hmm. I was on a scholarship. So, you know, that, that was problematic for me. When I talk to young people now, the thing I tell them is two weeks anywhere is an internship. So if you're at home, if you're wherever go, if you're wealthy and you've got, your parents have friends who own businesses and are professionals, ask them, can I come work at your job for two weeks? Whatever. If you are not, you ask your professors, who do you know? Who do you know? There are other resources where you can find relationships to get internships, but literally two weeks anywhere, that's an internship. You just need the exposure and the relationships because to me, all networking is, is a whole bunch of friends. That's mm -hmm. why I make mm -hmm. a lot of friends because friends yeah. have friends. Kids grow Kids graduating out of USC are having a lot of success because USC has so many relationships with That's the right. entertainment industry when they That's study right. there. What actually got you interested in the entertainment business anyway? I'm horrible at math. I mean, I'm the chick with a calculator. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I talk a lot. I was always doing James Brown in the kitchen. Like, I'm just that chick, curious, ask a lot of questions. And so, and I wasn't really sure what it, what, what it was, but I knew I wanted to work in television in some regard. So well, I was, oh, go ahead. No, no, no I was just going to ask you to tie into that because, um, you know, you mentioned working uh, on the Oprah Winfrey show. Do you have any favorite memories from that show? Oh my God, do I? The trips, number one. <laughs> <laughs> And you get a trip, and you get a trip. <laughs> yeah, we went on some incredible you got trips, trips, right? <laughs> well, that was the guess, but we went on right, some right. we, for those trips, we had to work, right? So right. that was fun. But Oprah took us on some amazing trips, which was really cool. Um, I did some of the most memorable shows um at Oprah. I didn't do it was funny, people always say, Did you do favorite things? Did you do this? And I was like, No, I'm not interested in those. You know, there were there weren't a lot of black producers at my level and when Oprah wanted to do something special she'd oftentimes call on me or, or another uh producer um but I I did the show where Oprah found out she had a sister mm -hmm. like as an adult she didn't know she had a sister so we secretly filmed for like a couple weeks and we spent all day kind of laying out this incredible story and we filmed it with an audience at 9 a.m it was airing the next day not one person in that audience spilled the beans and she was able to do this hour about finding wow. out she had a sister it was incredible wow. i did freedom writers uh, reunion with all the last living <gasps> writers oh my god that it was... was amazing oh that I, I i i remember seeing that watching that live <laughs> that incredible that was incredible oh. i did okay. um, and, and, and i don't want to tear up but okay keep yeah mm -hmm. I did the Martin Luther King special. We had a million dollar budget from Target and we shot the most incredible piece of television I've ever done. I mean, ever. Mm -hmm. And I shot mm -hmm. Oprah where Martin Luther King did his speech, the I have a dream speech. And we basically took the speech and we broke down the themes of each part of the speech. So interracial marriage, injustice, you know, black and white children coming together and we shot stories um along those lines and then i i filmed kids all over the country saying i have a dream you know i have a dream and i had them at the rosa parks museum i had special needs kids in washington i had kids on a reservation i had kids on the um uh on a boat with the with the statue of liberty behind them i mean it was an incredible undertaking. And we had a helicopter, we emptied out a school district. We had kids walk up a hill all at the same time with a helicopter flying over. And when they were given the cue from the helicopter, they all looked up and said, I have a dream. I mean, it oh, was- uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody's gonna go back in YouTube now. You know that, don't you? Oh yeah, it was the it was we got we got notes from all of Oprah's celebrity friends who were just blown away by the special. I would say that was probably my most 
that and I did the 200 men abused as boys. Mm, 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 so won an award with Tyler Perry. Yeah. Your shows brought tears across this world, not just nation, across this world. Some of them tears of joy and some of them tears of hope, you know? Wow. That's the hardest piece of television I've ever, ever had to produce. I mean, we had hundreds of conversations with adult men who were brutally raped and molested and and I said to them, you know, one of the things that we did that I thought was brilliant was there was a disconnect. Like we're talking to all these men and we're hearing their stories. They're horrific. But when you look at them, you're like, there was not, there was empathy, but not as much as seeing their childhood self. Mm -hmm. So we had them all bring a photo of themselves at the age that they were abused. And they were all in line and audience holding, and they were holding their pictures, waiting to get their frames. <gasps> And the energy in that room, because what it took for us to get these men to open up to us, some of them were, I mean, it took five months to book that show. I mean, we would talk to them over and they back out, they come back in, they back out. And so when we finally had them in the room, I think there was a, there was a collective sense of relief with all of them because they had never said it out loud. And here they were. 50 men, just half the audience holding line. And I just started to weep. And I walked in the yeah. hall and I bumped into Oprah who like the way Harpo was is we had a garage and Oprah would pull into the garage and then walk down this long blue hallway and then go left and go upstairs. So I was coming in and she was coming, we bumped into each other and I was like, oh my God, Oprah. And she'll stop, don't say anything, don't say mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. I want to meet them and experience them for the first time on the set. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And we walked, we split up. <laughs> and then the opening scene, we had all the men stand with their photos in the audience. And we did sweeping shots of them just to get the impact of what we were actually talking about. I saw about. that. I saw that. And I'm trying so hard not to, I don't cry pretty. So. <laughs> and we won a special Emmy for that. And it was, it was life-changing for all those men. It was really, it was. I'm not gonna walk away from this camera, but give me a second. Oh, oh no, yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, look, let, let, let's move it to your girl, the candy. You've got a 30-year uh, television career, right? And you you've got to have some thoughts about the ingredients it takes to make a great show. You just talked about making great show um, and teaching shows. Um, now, whether it's on network or streaming, what do you think are some of the ingredients to a great recipe for making it an incredible show? You know, I literally just said this to somebody. I always tell my producers, great television makes you feel something. So it makes you feel happy, sad, angry. I remember at The View, people would say, how could you EP that show? I can't stand that Joy Behar. I can't stand that Whoopi Goldberg, whoever was on either side of the whatever. I can't stand that Megan McCain. Well, guess what? I made you feel something. I'm doing my job, right? The whole point of that is to get, a, is to get you engaged in what you're watching. And so a lot of times when we're producing content, you, a lot of people don't notice it, but there's music beds on everything and music mm -hmm. should advance the story. It shouldn't be what we call thin, right? We're mm -hmm. just kind of there and it doesn't have a purpose. And so That's my mama, right? Exactly. And mm -hmm. TV is very nuanced. And, and the reason why I always tell people, the reason why you see a lot of daytime celebrity hosts who fail in daytime is because they just think, oh, I just sit there and start talking. Well, no, that's not how it works. It's incredibly nuanced. And the way you tell stories and how you tell them, the detail that has to happen in order for people to get a takeaway or for people to feel something, every single detail matters. And if you don't know what those details are, your television's flat, there's no authenticity, nobody connects and you lose. And so authenticity wins and the best television is in the details. Yeah, because as a viewer, you may not know what's missing, but you know that something's not there, don't That's you? Right. That's right. Uh, so so then what, what are the most important traits you think for executive producer to, to have, whether they're doing it for e-commerce or, um, or television or? You have to, you have to understand storytelling. So even though I'm doing, I'm selling products, right? No one's buying anything if the story's not great. I used to tell authors who came on Oprah, they'd always want to do this. 
they, they were like, can I hold my book? Can I hold my book? We're like, no. Then they'd be like, okay, so I'm going to say on page 47. And it's like, mm -mm, nobody wants to hear that. Tell a great story. Because if you are the most compelling human being that I see for five minutes during that show, I'm going to look up anything you've got because I want anything you're selling, right? All you have to do is tell an incredible, interesting, engaging, authentic story. And people will buy your book, your message, your e-commerce, whatever it is. The key to being a great producer is understanding how to tell a story. Maya Angelou, who I think all of us would agree used words, I mean, prolifically, didn't she say something to the effect, they may not remember what you said, but they'll always remember how you made them. How them feel, that's correct. Mm -hmm. That is correct. And that is the key to great television and successful hosts and producers. Well, look, with your permission, I'm going to invite you back because this is just an incredible conversation. Each of our each of our nuggets could have been a whole conversation in themselves. I, 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 I love you. I've met someone who I believe will become a new BFF. Uh, but uh, but let, let, let's go four for four. OK, so okay. four for four. Candy, what we do, I'm going to ask you four questions and you're going to give me four answers to each one. No right or wrong answers. It's just how you want to teach and share and what's important to you. Okay. And the first question is, you get to host a dinner and you invite any four people you want from any time in history past to now. Um, no futuristic folk, though. Um, and they don't have to be people you've met. They can be people you've read about or admire or have been inspired by. Who's going to be at your table? Wow. Um, hmm, that's really interesting because I've met a lot of people. <laughs> um, and there may be people at your table you've not met as well. This is your chance. <laughs> I know. Um, gosh, you know what's interesting? I've never really... Like I always tell people like they have the posters of people on their wall. Like I was just never that person. Um, right, right, right. I like everyday people. I get I, my, my tank gets filled from everyday folks who are just um, next level and interesting. And it's hard for me to say that because based on somebody's personal persona and their Facebook life or their celebrity life, I don't know who's uh -huh. thing, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'd love to have dinner with, with uh, President Obama. Okay. Um, Does Michelle come as well or just just Barack? Uh, I would say just Barack because I'm oh, listening to his yeah. book. Why? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I'm listening to Viola Davis's book. I'd love to, to invite so her. So is she coming as well? She's coming. That's two. Very wow. interesting. See, that table's starting to fill up now. It is. I would have to think this through, though, to get like more interest, you know, people that I'd really want to talk to. I'm trying to think if there are any C CEOs that I think are really interesting, um, like some incredible CEO who's really built an incredible business. Um, and uh, I don't, yeah, I just maybe some business like uber successful people who are pretty like down to earth and interesting, you know. Are they gonna be people who are building businesses today or would, would they come out of history for you? Like Madam C.J. Walker is kind of interesting. Right, right. that's what I was thinking uh, when you said that. I was thinking, wow, you know, the things that we didn't get to know about her because we only got other, and I met her uh, her granddaughter, Alelia, and she's incredible. We were honored today together <laughs> Uh, by uh, Black Enterprise a uh, few months ago. You and I, as you said, mentioned, were honored together at Holly Rod. I think, I think having her at your table, I would want to give you another seat and say you get five and I'm the fifth. <laughs> oh, and, yes, and, and, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, here's the matter, you included. I'm just more, like I'm less, I'm just, I like... I think it takes a very, my, my boss and I were talking about this today. Like he swings big. I've always swung big. I take a lot of risk, right? As do you clearly. And I think it's really interesting to talk to people who know, I jump off the building. I, this, I know that the parachute's coming, but I'm not worried yeah. about it. 
it gets a little scary at the beginning, but I go. And I just think if you don't swim, if you don't swing big, you don't win big. Right. And I'm always interested in people who swing big. So mm -hmm. like if I could do a broad stroke and say, that's my table, that's my table, you know, don't, you know, President Obama appears to have a very kind of calm demeanor. He did not get to where he is because right. he, like, you know what I'm saying? Like there, there's, there's a shark in there. There's a guy who's determined and has ambition. That understory, that understory which That's is right. why everyday people are so interesting to you. That's Everybody's right. got a story, but that understory, you know? That's right. And I, as you it, were speaking earlier about people in their inner child. Yeah. And I think, look, we all go through a lot of shit. I got, like I said, a special needs kid is the hardest thing I've ever done. It's horrible. I mean, I literally, my husband, I had to manhandle him to get on a plane because he was anxious. He didn't want to get on the airplane. Once he got there, he was nervous, but okay. But like, I weep the whole ride because it was just, I'm just like, oh my God, this is like my reality. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in in the plight of an everyday person or a person who says, who comes from extreme poverty, which is Viola Davis, and is able to like, you know, like heal. Because I think a lot of people mm -hmm. behave badly because they have demons they don't deal with. It takes a lot of courage, right? To face whatever that is, heal it, and then have a productive and normal life or an extraordinary life, right? Mm -hmm. I, think I, grew up, I grew up in a very stable home. I had no issues, you know, along the lines of abuse and anything like that. So I feel very blessed. But I was also very driven. So why was I so driven as an upper middle class kid who like went to school early to work out number one in this? Did, you know what I mean? Where does that? It's just so you you know these people from different walks of life who find purpose and meaning and go after it. And I don't. And I think the biggest thing that holds people back is fear, right? And I see it in a lot of people. And what's really interesting is the people closest to you are more afraid for you than you are, and they mm. are the ones that hold you back, mm. right? So. Mm. That whole kind of thing is interesting to me. Sorry, I know that wasn't for people. No, 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 that's rich. That's beautiful. And 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 you and I can have that dinner without those other people. Well, we need to have dinner because I want to talk about you. We, we Can yeah. we just go to dinner when you're in New York or I'll come visit you and, and play golf and we'll come to Vegas? We absolutely can. And, you know, I'm, I'm in... Um, uh, Boston, I I, uh, I just took on the chair of the Women's Leadership Board housed out of the Kennedy School of Government, so we can also connect there as well. Come in. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'll, I'll serve you the dinner, okay? We will offline about this, but I'm excited because you're a beast, <laughs> and I want to hear how you built your empire, my friend. <laughs> we absolutely can do that, my new BFF. Um, yeah. So let's go two for four. What are you, what four things are you listening to right now? And um, if they are things that you want to encourage our family to listen to, please tell us why. So I'm listening to Viola Davis's memoir, which is phenomenal. Oh my God, it's so good. We just drove back from Martha's Vineyard. I listened to five hours. I ran errands all day yesterday. Every time just I got, got back from Martha's Vineyard. How did I? Miss you there. I was there for two weeks. Girl, I was there for. I can't the, believe the, it. The, 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 you know, the Black Economic Forum that McKesson. I can't believe, I, I can't believe it. Yeah. How, how did we not know and that? And then I went over to History Makers for Business Makers, which was, uh, which, which happened there as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We, we'll connect on that. Anyway, you're listening. You're listening to books. Oh, huh? my Get Viola Davis's memoir. It is phenomenal. Somebody recommended it to me and my whole car was mesmerized listening to it on the way home. Um, I'm listening to Barack Obama's book, which is really interesting. Um, just in general, I, I'm like really feeling um, Elton John station on Pandora. I went to the concert by myself. I heard it was at Newark. I was like, oh my God, it's tomorrow night. Paid 400 something dollars for a ticket, went alone. Had the best time. Um, that's so good to know because my girlfriend who actually so lives good. in New Jersey uh, has invited me to go to a concert we're going to go to Elton John when he comes to LA so we're really excited about that must, must last go. time so right good. last time live concert in LA very well very very good really enjoyed it um, and then I just love ratchet hip hop like old school ratchet hip hop <laughs> yeah 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 for all obvious reasons 
<laughs> okay, let's I go. I love hip hop, so like that's you know, I'd like old school. Who age. who do you love? How old does it go for you? I like I'm old enough to be your mom, right? So I can go way back. You right. know, I'm, I'm 53. I can so go I'm cool more D. <laughs> right. No, like I was, you know, I went to school on the East Coast. So like I remember special ed, this rapper special ed used to come to our, to Boston College. He was friends with this guy who went to BC. You know, all that, like I love Ice Cube, like West Coast Ice Cube, Easy E, um, um, DJ Quick. I love DJ Quick, honey. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, AMG and then all the East Coast rappers, you know, EPMD and uh, okay, well, you just pick them up on Spotify, right? They, exactly. They're, 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 they're going to be playing now. Uh, yeah. Let's go three. Let's go three for four, Candy. Um, candy girl. Let's go uh, three for four. Uh huh. Uh, <laughs> and this is about what you're reading, and you already mentioned two that you're listening to. So, what else are you reading? Four things you're oh reading. That, and 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 please, please, if you're recommending it, tell us why. Okay, I am reading this book. First of all, I love a beach read. I'm not fancy. So uh, I'm reading um, Red, White, and Royal Blue. It is so good. <laughs> it's, I have not heard of that book and I think I'm up on books. It's so good. It's about um, the son of the new the president who's a woman and the, and the prince. Um, and they like getting like a fight and it's a whole thing and it's kind of it's so good and um oh i see the edges i see the edges have been um, yeah okay so it, so so, so so production team you got to pull that out and text me that's about that because i'll be picking that up for weekend read and then i just read um jennifer weiner that summer which is really good we did hear jennifer's last name weiner Yes, W E I N E R. Okay. Um, that summer, really mm -hmm. healthy and delicious. Mm -hmm. um, and then my girlfriend bought me these Emily Henry books. Um, they're right there. Beach read. Um, book lovers, and there's like three sets of like. I just wanted all beach reads. I love really yeah. like, like rom com mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. books. So mm -hmm. that's that's what I'm into right now. That's that's good. And I bet so many people are going to enjoy being able to have, you know, that referral on it because you can hit and miss really bad when you go mm -hmm. into that uh, genre as well. OK, so we're going to do four for four. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. This one you specifically, Candy, are giving four pieces of advice to our family. Okay. If it's advice that's been given to you and it's not your own originated authentic advice. Please share that. with us who gave it to you and why it's important. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, in general, four pieces of advice. All right. The first one is be impeccable. So if you talk to anybody who's worked for me for 30 years, um, you know, you they can't yell at me or scream at me because I don't do it. And I work in an industry where people like pride themselves on bad behavior. There are a lot of industry stories about people on television screaming, yelling, and throwing things, not having it. So be impeccable because when you're impeccable, people don't have a leg to stand on, right? And you create a culture that's respectful. Um, my second piece of advice is, uh, in my Angela, people show you who they are, believe them. And it's interesting. The first time, the first time. Or maybe the second or third. I don't typically... <laughs> I'm not a first time person because I like to give people the benefit of the doubt or I'm like, oh, that really happened the way I think it happened. Um, but I think as I've gotten older, right, and I'm, I'm less tolerant of bad behavior or I'm less tolerant of inauthenticity, um, I just kind of pull back, you know, not that I can't be in the space or be in some level of community with these types of folks, but they're not my, you know. Because mm -hmm. I remember, you know, um, I think, um, you know, I, a really good piece of advice is build wealth. You know, I, my husband and I, since we were in our twenties, saved fifteen percent of every dime we made, and I mean every bonus. You know, when you get to a point where you make a certain amount of money, you're and you're working with a W two, and your four hundred one k maxes out. People are like, ooh, I got a raise. We're like, uh-uh. We took that money, we wrote a check and we sent it to. And so I 
did shows early on with David Bach, who wrote the book Automatic Millionaire. By the way, that's a great, two great financial reads, Automatic Millionaire and Rich Dad, Poor Dad, two of the Ooh. best financial books you could read. But what David said is compound interest over 30 years. If you save that latte, the price of a latte every single day for 30 years, you'll be a millionaire, right? Similarly, if you save 15% of every dime gross, not net, the gross number, all that stuff's taken out, you get paid net, but you take that 15% off gross, you will be a millionaire if you're in your 20s right now by the time you're 40. So, and it's real, it happens, it's real. So we have to, um, we have to make the wealth gap smaller between black and other, right? And that only- um, that 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 um, experience at Martha's Vineyard that we just shared, we crossed and didn't see each other, was the mm-hmm. Black Economic Forum, and McKinsey yeah. uh, um, and Executive Leadership Conference are doing incredible work. That from that forum goes out and just touches the Black community. And I know you're giving advice for everyone, and our mm-hmm. family is bigger than the Black community. Our family also recognizes that the black community has just historically been at the lower end and continue. And we've got to, we've got to change that dynamic. Well, and to this, the connection, last piece of advice to this point is, is just try to live an authentic life. Right. And what that means is like, you know, I don't have to run around with like four pair of Louboutins and a big old Chanel bag. Those, you know, when I see people with, a Range Rover and the big watch and they're dripping and all kinds of crap. It just tells me you got a lot of bills, you know, mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. and you would be surprised when you dig in, these are folks who don't have cash flow. They don't have a lot of home. Savings. They're renting. They're renting. They don't own. And, you know, my husband and I bought houses when we were 26. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? mm-hmm. So in order to build wealth, you have to be okay with you. You have to be okay saying, well, you know, I have one nice watch. I don't have eight. I'm like, who cares? It doesn't matter. You know, I remember I went to this party and, and you know, I understand. Here's what I understand. There is a uniform, right? If you're going to be in certain crowds, just like if you were going to go play football, you need a helmet and shoulder pads. If you're going to go play golf, you need the right shorts in a club. Similarly, if you're going to go hang out with this group of people, I do understand intellectually that there is a uniform, right? You want to conform to some extent if you're going to be with that crowd, but it doesn't mean that's who you are, right? And understanding that is the key. You don't have- Audrey Hepburn during her lifetime was, uh, and she was an incredible woman anyway, on a lot of levels that people are just gaining consciousness to uh, today. Uh, One of the things I recall her uh, talking about was having been on the best dressed list, people kept best dressed lists then. Um, She said, having been on that list for so many times, it would amaze her because she never had more than five outfits in her own closet. Now, her work necessarily was in entertainment, as you know, and in movies. And so she was being dressed for movies, but in her own personal wardrobe and in her own personal life, she still had many opportunities and events as many people do today to have just oodles and oodles of clothing. And she didn't. She said that one simple thing that worked well, that you feel good in, that you can accessorize differently, worked so well for her. But I I do see people in this age of everybody has their own personal brand, taking that branding to really being an imitation of what they've seen versus... Mm -hmm. And, you know, an iteration of who they are. That's right. That's right. So that's my last piece of advice, you know, and that's how you build wealth. And the end of the day, you know, we're 53. I'm going to soft retire in eight years and just do what I want to do because we were smart. We bought real estate. We saved our money. We moved into a two flat because we couldn't afford, you know, to buy anything. We saved our money. We bought our first two flat, you know, then we bought another one. Then we figured out, oh, at the time you could, you know, borrow, you know, against the equity. And we figured it out because we did the research and we asked questions and we were like relentless. And so we I, look, I always say like, we don't have um, state and park place. We have like Baltic and Mediterranean, but we did. <laughs> right, right. You know, we made sacrifices and I'll never forget when I was at Oprah, one of the producers like knew that I lived in a two flat in a nice neighborhood. We live in a great neighborhood, but 
she was just like, so are you going to like stay in that like two flat thing you live in? And I'm like, uh-huh. You know what I mean? Like I had a car that was paid for, for 10 years. Like I doubled the payments and paid off the car in three years. And I just kept the car for, you know, and by you know, our expenses were so low. And mm. the show ended mm. I had options because I was house poor. You know, mm -hmm. it was like, I think our rent by the time the Oprah show ended was $200 a month. Oh my goodness. Wow. We refied and the PMI went away and we had increased our rent from the upstairs unit. Mm -hmm. So free yourself, you know, free yourself. You don't need all that stuff because if you can pay down your debt and you can acquire assets, you become wealthy. And then when you're in your fifties, you don't have to work. You know, you can make better choices that make you happy. You can do things that make you happy. And at the end of the day, as I get older, if you don't have your health, your wealth, and your happiness, you have nothing. <laughs> no, we just dropped the mic on that. Oh, my goodness. Miss Candy, my new BFF. Let's see how I can't friends. wait to have dinner. I'm coming up to Boston. I'm gonna okay, have Okay, let's see how I let's have see how, in Boston too. Let's see how friendship fits us, okay? I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um from my house, from my heart to your home. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was great.